our memory storage systems have changed. They are interconnected and dematerialized, and now hold our personal, medical, scientific, technical, and administrative information. How are we going to be able to transmit an increasingly massive and complex digital heritage? Yet in the 1980s, we thought we had discovered the secrets of an eternal medium. And now, watch this disc closely. In principle, this is the disc of the future, a digital disc nearly indestructible. It is never in contact with any other object as a laser scans and reads its surface. No microgrooves, an indestructible 12 centimeter disc. Marketed as the avant-garde digital medium, the CD soon captured the market for data storage. The CD was small and supposedly totally reliable. Libraries, archives, individuals, everyone adopted this new medium. The laser of a CD drive decodes the digital data on the disk. If we look at the surface of a CD, enlarged 4,500 times, the engraved message appears clearly. The zeros of the binary code appear as ridges and pits, and the ones are produced by the intervals between these ridges and pits. But in 2003, researchers at the National Laboratory of Metrology and Testing in Paris sounded the alarm. Initially, when the idea of looking at disks arose in the 2000s, we were merely trying to assess the quality of CD recordings, which was a problem. After conducting a check one year after testing the recording quality of a disk, we were very surprised to see that we did not retrieve anything like the results we had been expecting. The disk had completely changed, and we noted loss of data on the disk. This was really a surprise because the disk was expected to last 100 years, according to the manufacturers. The researchers started to look at the thin metal layer containing the ridges and pits that conveyed the data contained on the CD. They examined the discs, made by different brands, under an electronic microscope. Several of them had similar anomalies. Even if you store your CDR in a closed cabinet protected from light and any other external damage, you can lose data by particles that were introduced when the disc was manufactured. Here, in fact, we can see an oxidized particle. This oxidization can even pierce the metal layer of the CDR and destroy your data. These unwanted particles can sometimes destroy data on a CD in just one year. We are a long way from the promises made in the early years to the point where it is questionable as to whether CDs are suitable as long-term storage media. To find out, Jacques Perderot and his staff tested hundreds of disks via a process of artificial aging. These CDs were exposed to high levels of humidity and temperatures. The results speak for themselves. They demonstrate that in certain cases, the ink of the labels glued to the CD can seep through the thickness of the disc and damage the metal layer containing the digital data. In the long term, CDs turn out to be fragile, unstable medium. These tests determine the estimated life expectancy for CDs. The average life expectancy of a CD is fairly hard to determine. What we saw through sampling several collections was that nearly 15% of the CDs had a life expectancy of around one to five years, while the other 85% could last more than 20 years. The laboratory conclusions were irrefutable. 
Today, CDs are no longer considered to be reliable as long-term storage media. What about the hard drives that most of us use to store our data? They form the core of a computer's memory. Every day, they record massive quantities of digital data, thanks to a technique that is both ingenious and precise. A hard drive consists of a set of circular platters that revolve at high speed. The rotation of these disks create an airflow maintaining the magnetic reed head at an infinitesimal distance from the surface. Relatively speaking, this corresponds to a Concorde flying at full speed one meter above the ground. You can see that the smallest chunk, the tiniest piece of dust, which is large in relation to the distance between the head and the platter, will be catastrophic. Once the head has touched the platter, the hard drive is dead because the head is stuck to the platter via molecular bonding. Hard drives are vulnerable to shock and are not entirely safe from dust and impurities. Manufacturers therefore cannot guarantee them for more than five years. Do the flash memory in our cameras and USB flash drives offer a more reliable alternative? USB flash drives, SSDs, as well as the flash cards used in cameras, for example, raise another problem in that they have a finite number of read-write cycles. The number of read-write cycles is quite large, up to 100,000, but in computer systems, these 100,000 cycles are reached fairly quickly. If, however, you use a USB drive, an SSD, or a flash card for archive purposes, in other words, you record your data on it and then store the device, then it's entirely possible to keep the information for a dozen years. A life expectancy of five years, 10 years, 20 years, mankind has never in its history stored so much information on such fragile media. Will we be able to store our digital memory for more than a century, let alone several millennia? This question has already arisen in certain sectors that have already started to archive sensitive data. ANDRA, the French National Radioactive Waste Management Agency, stores thousands of barrels filled with more or less active nuclear waste in its storage sites and concrete blockhouses. Each barrel is marked with a barcode, identifying the digital file that contains the data vital to the site's archives. In order to contain the dangerous radioactivity, the barrels must be stored securely for 300 years. Where will digital technology be in three centuries? Will a system capable of reading our current media still exist? There's really no issue with digital per se. The problem is that it's a kind of endless screw that we're not sure we can keep turning ad vitam aeternum, because digital often changes standards, becoming increasingly compact. For example, those 5-inch floppy disks we used 20 years ago, you can't find a single machine to read them today. So you have to migrate your files to new media, maybe even with new software every 10 years. And this endless screw, it's hard to be able to guarantee that in 1,000 years we will have been able to keep it turning. So we will have to develop parallel solutions to make sure that in the long term, data is transmitted where we want it to be. What media was therefore selected to back up digital methods and offer fairly reliable, secure storage to withstand this test of time? Andra opted for old friends, paper and ink. Today, we have permanent paper without any added bleaching chemicals, 
They do not deteriorate over time. The data is printed using acrylic ink that is extreme in the long term. The paradox is instructive. Over the period of a century, digital does not compare with paper, which we have had since ancient times. The most radioactive waste requires another time scale. Andra intends to bury, at great depths, the radioactive materials that will only stop being a risk in 500 years, and for some, 5,000 years. Throughout this entire period, we need to know where they are buried in the storage conditions at all times. A solution appeared while excavating the 1,400 meters of galleries for the underground laboratory. For very long-term memory, if we think in terms of many millennia, one of the ideas we are exploring is to use what we call dump sites. In other words, areas where we place the material excavated from underground. Geologically speaking, this material should not be found in the places where it will be. And we are thinking of placing within these dump sites a certain number of inscriptions on media that are currently under study to explain to future archaeologists, future geologists, why this geological geological material is in a place it shouldn't be, thereby indicating the existence of a storage site. Ander is still researching a digital media that is sufficiently strong and stable enough to be placed inside these dump sites to indicate to future generations the presence of nuclear materials buried deep underground. Perhaps they should look to the civilizations that sent us messages engraved in rock a very long time ago. These would be, for example, the hieroglyphs from ancient Egypt. Once again, the past is guiding us toward the future. We now have a mineral that is heat and acid resistant that can withstand radio waves. It may not be indestructible, but in any case, it is far stronger than any stone obelisk. It is quartz. In Japan, engineers at the Hitachi Laboratories, partnered with Kyoto University, have been working with quartz, trying to create the most stable digital storage medium ever created. They must, however, discover a way to overcome the extreme resistance of this rock crystal. We began our research in 1996, when the Miura Laboratory discovered that a laser could modify the structure of quartz. We then studied the possibility of using this technique for long-term data storage. I am now going to record data on this sliver of quartz. The data is recorded by a femtosecond laser. This laser emits pulses of around one billionth of a second. The pulse creates perfectly formed microscopic dots a dot for zero, and a no dot for one in binary code. Dozens of dots can be recorded at once. The information is embedded in the layers and is therefore unaffected by dust or scratches. Another advantage of quartz, the transparency means that the information can be read by any microscope. To conserve digital data for long periods, we cannot always rely on a reader to access information. If CD players were no longer manufactured, for example, it would become difficult to retrieve any data. With this technique, we can access the data using a traditional optical microscope. 
we could easily read the information even in a distant future. What time frame? 100 years? 500 years? 1,000 years? 10,000 years? To test the strength of this medium, a slice of quartz is placed in an oven heated to 1,000 degrees. Two hours later, the slice and the embedded data are intact. It also withstands thermal shock when it is thrown into water at ambient temperature. An acid bath has no effect on it. We determined that the life expectancy of the data we embedded on the strips of quartz is extremely long, from 300 million to several billion years. We could therefore store data reliably and safely for extremely long periods. What is still an experimental procedure looks to be extremely promising. One major hurdle that remains is a limited storage capacity. For now, it is barely greater than that of Blu-ray technology. This would be sufficient to save the data of waste storage centers for a long time. Yet we are a long way from being able to handle the deluge of information produced by certain scientific tools. The CERN particle accelerator is a giant ring, 27 kilometers in circumference, buried 100 meters underground on the French-Swiss border. Two particle beams are circulated at high speed inside this ring. Analyses of the collision of these beams, captured by ultra-sensitive detectors, have helped pierce the mysteries of matter in the origin of the universe. We're here at the CMS detector, where the particles of the LHC collider come from both directions here, and they collide there in the middle and produce many collisions. You can compare this, more or less, with a digital camera. But in your digital camera, the sensor is about this size, whereas here you see it's a big volume, about 10 by 10 meters. And the further difference is that the camera typically takes 50 pictures per second, whereas here we take 40 million times per second a picture, which corresponds to producing 10,000 DVDs per second. Given this quantity, information must be selected. Electronic filters only let through data that is considered pertinent. Even so, the amount of data processed by the computing center is impressive. Initially, this data is stored on thousands of hard drives stored in computer racks. Scientists can therefore access the data they need for their research very quickly. Yet the amount of data is so large that it would take several decades to analyze them, even if CERN had a network of computers that could process millions of operations per second. Unlocking the secrets of matter in the universe takes time, a period of time that is much too long given the fragility of the hard drives on these servers. This is why the CERN IT engineers had to use another medium to ensure the long-term storage of their valuable data. The Large Hadron Collider data are stored here. Here means in these cartridges that contain tapes. Automated units like these fetch them when a physicist needs to re-examine or reanalyze data. There are more than 50,000 robot-managed tapes, which are used as archive media for all of the LHC data. Why tapes? In fact, I've been here at least 15 or 20 years, and the same question always comes up. 
Aren't we going to change the system? The answer is no. There are several reasons. First, recent analysis demonstrate that tapes are a thousand times more reliable than discs. Second, tapes, when they are not reused, don't consume any electricity. Third, if you drop a hard drive, there's a very good chance that it will be completely destroyed. That's not true of a tape. The plastic container could be damaged, but we would be able to retrieve the data. Proof of its reliability, the first computers made in the 1950s opted for tape. And since this pioneering era, the storage capacity of tapes has been constantly increasing. The storage capacity of tapes, as for disks, and the density of transistors on a processor is limited. Yet today, several manufacturers have proven, through lab tests, that tapes could achieve a capacity of 50 terabytes per cartridge. We are therefore at a factor of 10 from these theoretical limits. The quantity of information generated by the LHC may seem to be enormous, but it is just a drop of water in the sea of data that we produce on a planetary scale. Over a 24-hour period, 145 billion emails are sent, some 4.5 internet searches. Every day we generate 2.5 trillion bytes of data. These astronomical numbers are so hard to conceive that the computer sector had to invent its own scale based on the byte. A byte consists of eight bits, representing zeros or ones. Therefore, a single character of text corresponds to a byte. One page, three kilobytes. 300 pages, a megabyte. A library, a gigabyte. Five libraries, a DVD. Six million books, a terabyte, or a stack of 200 DVDs. A 200-meter stack of DVDs represents a petabyte. A one-kilometer high stack of DVDs, an exabyte, is the equivalent of all the information produced by humanity through 2003. A stack of DVDs stretching from the Earth to the Moon represents 1.8 zettabytes, or all the information produced in the year 2011. A stack of DVD linking Mars to the Sun represents a yottabyte, or the volume of digital data generated within the next five years. At first sight, no existing medium could store such a huge mass of data. Does this mean our societies are facing an impasse? Certainly not. Scientists responsible for storing data have understood that we now have to change our mindset. They are now looking at a device we all carry within us and that has already proved to be effective. This complex system, whose immense resources still hold many surprises, is DNA, contained in the chromosomes of all forms of life. Nick Goldman and his team are exploring this aspect of DNA at the European Bioinformatics Institute in the UK. There's lots of reasons why DNA is a good medium. It's very, very small. It's very inexpensive. It lasts a very long time. It doesn't require any energy. And we will always be able to read DNA. So something like a, a, a floppy disk is no longer readable. Uh, in a few years' time, probably DVDs will no longer be readable because we won't have the technology any longer to do that. But DNA, we will always have some technology to read DNA. The technology changes, and at the moment, it's changing very fast. Every couple of years, there's a new machine to read DNA. But because it's the, the stuff in our, in our own genomes, uh, we will always have a new machine that can read DNA. Nick Goldman's team decided to encode in DNA a photograph of their institute, a text on genetics, some Shakespearean sonnets, and an audio file of Martin Luther King's famous I Have a Dream speech. Oh, in Alabama, with its vicious racist. 
The challenge was to move from a computer language consisting of zeros and ones to a much more complex genetic code that involves not just two, but four components. The four DNA molecules symbolized by the letters A, C, T, G. These four elements came together at the bottom of the oceans millions of years ago to create the vocabulary of life. The famous DNA double helix is certainly the first code that ever existed on planet Earth. But with DNA, we have four letters that we can use. Uh, and it's like, a, it's like looking at Lego, where I have four colors of blocks. And I can put those together in any order to make a message. And we devised a code that would use different, uh, it's like colors, but letters of DNA. Uh, and each little block would represent one byte or one small part of the signal. And then we can put those together in any order to make the larger signal. And we devised a code that would do this, uh, but would minimize the number of errors that would happen uh, due to reading and writing DNA. Nick Goldman and his staff started with the zeros and ones encoding the photograph, texts, and the audio file. They then applied their mathematical code to switch from this binary language to the four letters ACTG, forming the DNA code. The photograph, texts, and speech were then fragmented into thousands of DNA segments. These were then reproduced chemically. At the end of the process, the original digital message is recorded on thousands of inert artificial DNA strands. Now the DNA holds the information in physical form. It looks like it's empty, but there's a tiny speck of DNA in there, and we sent that to the laboratories in Heidelberg to be read. At this point, genetics takes over from digital processing. To test the process, the strands were sent to the European Molecular Biology Laboratory in Germany to be decoded. Biologists place the DNA strands in sequencers. These instruments will read the combinations of the four letters A, C, T, G. Imagine the data which are produced in large research facilities like CERN or here at EMBL. Then you have to find a proper way to store it or at least to archive it in the first instance. Otherwise, all the scientific progress we are doing in the near future, we can't access it anymore. It starts already that our society is losing knowledge. And actually, I think that the research on DNA storage is one of the really promising fields in this area. Another advantage of DNA, it is a solid material that stands up perfectly to transport. To store DNA, you have to really consider three parameters. The first thing is to have to keep it cold, and you have to keep it dry, because this is preventing any chemical reactions around. The third thing is you should prevent it from light. It is therefore not surprising that the frozen dry ground of Siberia was perfect for conserving the DNA fragments of animals that had died thousands of years ago. About one year ago, a scientific paper was published studying the genomes of ancient horses, and they had samples of DNA that had lasted for 700,000 years, and they were able to successfully read back much of that DNA. So that's an experiment that has already been done that shows that DNA can last holding an information, holding a signal for more than half a million years. It took the German team nearly two weeks to decode all the DNA sequences sent by the British Research Institute. 
all the DNA strands were read and all the messages were fully retrieved. After we receive the sequence read information back from the Heidelberg laboratory, we decode those fragments of DNA uh, and we put back together the binary files um, based on that information. And then we want to compare whether that exactly matches what we started with. So the photograph looks exactly the same. And we also checked uh, in the computer whether every single bit, every zero and one was correct, and it was. Nick Goldman and his colleagues demonstrated that encoding digital information in DNA strands is a perfectly realistic alternative that could also offer large storage capacities. So using the same system that we used in our experiment, the, the full size of all the information in the whole world is two cubic meters. So that's two meters by one meter by one meter, so you could fit that all in the back of a large car. For now, the process is still experimental, as it is complex and expensive. Yet it is conceivable, and within the realm of possibility, that in the future storage sites could archive millions of test tubes containing the strands of DNA memory just like we store and organize books in our libraries today. Our memory could then be set into the language of living matter. The question of longevity would be solved, but another problem, a considerable one, would still remain. With the internet, information has become unstable, as if the books in our libraries were being replaced every second. A reliable memory system must factor in this dynamic. None of the storage methods, CD, quartz, tape, and even DNA, can record unstable memory. Our digital data, our photographs, our emails, now have a medium that matches their proliferation, a sort of perpetually changing library, the cloud. The term is ambiguous. It suggests that our digital data have become totally ephemeral. But that is not the case. The cloud does indeed have a physical location, in data centers. A data center is first and foremost a stronghold, a type of safe that guarantees the security of the data it contains. Serge Abitboul from the French Institute for Research in Computer Science and Automation offers to take us around the largest European data center located in northern France. Some of the billions of digital data that transit every second over the internet are processed and stored in these rows. This is a rack. There are hundreds of them all around us. They consist of computers and disks. This is the cloud. All the memory of companies, memories of individuals, your photographs, your emails, it's all located in racks like this somewhere on the planet in data centers. The cloud of data centers manages our digital lives every day, including an increasingly large share of our private lives.
La mémoire de, de the memory of humanity, the memory of individuals, is to a certain extent contained in data centers. This data is extremely valuable. We can't lose it. We don't want to lose your photographs. And the only way, the method that we have now found to keep and protect your information is essentially to replicate it. Therefore, with the data centers, our memory will always be constantly duplicated from hard drive to hard drive to remain permanent. The fact that you can take digital information and replicate it, reproduce it, typically infinitely, means that there is a small probability that an error will be introduced at some point. So the question is, we can live with a small probability, but when we reproduce and reproduce and reproduce, this small probability of error can become large over time. We have inserted correcting codes in the digital representation of data, which means that we can guarantee that a copy will always be reliable. Every digital message recorded on any kind of medium whatsoever carries its own error-correcting codes, ensuring that the data is copied perfectly. Protected in this way, a file can be replicated indefinitely, on-site or in another data center located far away from the first. Therefore, every day, even if hundreds of hard drives crash in a data center, it has no impact on our data because it has been duplicated. As our digital memories become mobile, transitory, its volume continues to grow and data centers proliferate. We are generating an ever-increasing amount of information, knowledge, and the question raised is obviously whether this information, this knowledge, will be available in 50 years, in 100 years. Will a researcher or university professor 100 years from now be able to study the Internet of the early 21st century? And what will be available? Will we still have the Internet? Will we still have a trace of all of that? With the Internet, constantly enlarged by the data centers, information is now in flux. The web is changing all the time. Pages appear every second, while others disappear. What method can be used so that future generations can consult this memory that has become ephemeral and transitory? After ensuring the conservation of French television and radio archives, the INA, the Institut National de l'Audiovisuel, now has the delicate mission of archiving internet traffic from all the French sites involved in this sector. IT engineers in the Internet Archive Department are sorting these sites and storing them page by page. Each web page consists of numerous elements that produce the display, including texts, images, codes, and display elements. For example, this web page consists of nearly 200 objects. All these objects can be modified over time, expanded, destroyed. Our mission is to visit each page as regularly as possible, because if we merely captured one given moment of a website, we would not get an accurate idea of its dynamic, its evolution, how it is updated, how information is added over time. If I use the metaphor of a film, we try to capture not 24 images per second, but 20 images per day to film, to capture an overview of the websites. At any moment, someone may add a comment, another attach an image, a third include a link, and so on, in a constantly evolving environment. Storing the Internet is a colossal task. The IT staff at the INA uses web robots. 25 times a day, they fetch all the images, texts, and audio files on each page of each of the 10,000 websites they follow. The internet flow is therefore captured via a series of snapshots. 
In five years, the INA engineers have gathered 25 billion files, including 7 billion web pages. This fragmented memory stored on tape will be available to historians and researchers who will one day take a look back on the world as it is today. Their job will be even more complex in that the internet is certainly going to continue to expand all the time. Here, each site is symbolized by a point. This representation of the internet illustrates a complexity that looks similar to match what we know about the universe. The total number of existing websites reached the one billion mark in 2014. A historian 1,000 years from now studying the early 21st century will have an inconceivable quantity of information available. It will therefore be much harder to sort through it and make any sense of it given such a profusion of data. Do we run the risk of disappearing given this immensity? Internet traffic creates a mass of data that can overwhelm our digital memory if we don't have efficient computer tools to manage them. Researchers in Venice, equipped with powerful data analysis software, have launched a mining project, much like archaeologists, of the largest paper archives in the world. Their approach is probably an example of how future historians will work, given the immense quantity of information that we are currently generating. The field of investigation is not the internet, but rather the archives of the state of Venice. Millions of documents spanning 10 centuries of the city's history are stored in 80 kilometers of shelves. It includes birth and death certificates, business registers and notarized deeds, along with other documents, both valuable and mundane. With these priceless archives, it will be possible to reconstruct, nearly day by day, the life of the city and its residents, to form a kind of Google ahead of its time. How to query such a large quantity of information? The Venice Time Machine project, begun by the city of Venice and the École Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne, the EPFL, is trying to answer this question. The Venice Time Machine project aims to create new tools for navigating through the thousand years of Venetian and European history, based on a major digitization of the Venice archives. The idea is essentially to transform the dozens of kilometers of documents that we have into an open information system that will be accessible via new navigation interfaces. By disassociating the document from its medium, digitization dispenses with the need to handle paper, which is heavy and bulky. In a sense, the information is suspended in a digital space. Then it can be accessed an infinite number of ways. A word or a proper noun can be found nearly instantaneously within the thousands of scattered documents. What digital indexing of documents allows is to make interconnections that would have been impossible to do before. You are able to find all the documents that deal with a particular person, even from different series of documents, wills, apprenticeship contracts, various official acts. You are able to do the same thing for places. In other words, find all the documents referring to a particular place among the mass of documents. You can restrict this search to a specific place and time, therefore offering new ways of accessing information that would be totally impossible to do if you were working with a traditional catalog and regular paper records. 
Did the Venetian administrators from the year 1000 even imagine that one day they would face physical limits? While paper records are efficient, it is a laborious process. Ten centuries later, we now have algorithms and software that can create connections between diverse data in order to make sense of it. And thus, another history of the Venetian Republic, one that is more subtle, more nuanced, more accurate, emerges from the enormous mass of disparate papers. Each of the documents we have transcribed is then analyzed to search for the names of people and places. Here we have a person named Battista Nani, who is linked to several other people who have been identified by the recognition algorithm. And little by little, it forms an initial graph which is linked to this particular document. The same process is repeated for others, such as tax declarations, for example. Here, Battista Nani is connected to other people. When we have extracted all the data, we can then gather all the information available on a particular person. In this way, we can create this large graph that forms something like a Facebook of the past. It will only continue to grow as we digitize and analyze the archives. Battista Nani, whose name in life had been buried in a sea of paper, has been revived. Now, Venetians from the past are no longer immersed in an anonymous crowd, but become individual, interacting destinies that have fashioned history. One of the great strengths of the Venice archives is that there is so much documentation on the microhistory. In other words, the history of all the Venetians and not merely the major figures. This forms the dense fabric of history with a capital H, the history we study. And I truly hope that in the future, historians looking back at our era, perhaps in 100 years or 200 years, will have available a sufficient amount of data to reconstruct our contemporary era with the same density. It is not so much the fragility of the hard drives of the future, what matters is our ability to set up procedures to encode, recode, transmit and perpetuate over all these years the data we will have created. In our time, we are gathering the same type of individual and collective information that were collected over the centuries by the Venetians, along with the data produced by major research laboratories, that of administrations, plus Facebook, Twitter and other social networks. If we do not have instruments capable of navigating through this mass of information, they will be hard to consult, just like the paper archives prior to the development of the Venice time machine. These new navigational tools already exist. In the United States, IBM has developed an ultra-powerful interface called Watson. With its algorithms, this supercomputer can analyze and retrieve 200 million pages in three seconds. In the near future, we may have an interface on our computers or our mobile phones that will have enough computing power to be something of an additional memory device. At present, our memory is an interconnected mass memory that can be consulted constantly in which, despite the fragility of the current media, we'll keep information available. For a very long time, we have been afraid of falling into oblivion. It's the fear of death, the idea that we are going to disappear. Memory is a way of holding on to time and, in a certain way, avoiding death. Because now, the question of retaining thought, retaining the memories that we have of a person, of a country, or of some history, is now a needless fear, because we can conserve everything with digital memory. But keeping everything now raises an entirely new set of questions for the history of humankind.